Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's live webinar, Responsible Science, Can You Trust Your Antibody?, presented by Dr. Anthony Cuvion, Scientific Manager, Project Manager, and Dr. Randy Wetzel, Director of Cytometry at Cell Signaling Technology. I'm Susie Valdez, and I'll be your moderator for today's educational webinar, presented by LabRoots and sponsored by Cell Signaling Technology. Cell Signal Technology is a private family-owned company founded by scientists and dedicated to providing the world's highest quality innovative research and diagnostic products to accelerate biological understanding and enable personalized medicine. Before we begin, I want to remind everyone that today's event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time you want during the presentation. Just click on that green Q&A button located at the lower left of your presentation window and type your questions into the box that appear on the screen. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. Also, we will be conducting some polls during this presentation. The polls will pop up in your slide window and we would appreciate your participation. Please notice that you are viewing this presentation in a slide window. To enlarge that window, just click on the screen icon located at the lower right. If you have any trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, click on the support button at the top right of your presentation window or use that Q&A button and let us know you're having a problem. This presentation is educational and thus offers continuing education credits. Click on the button in the bottom left-hand corner and follow the process to obtain your credits. I'd now like to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Anthony Cuvion and Dr. Randy Wetzel. First, Dr. Cuvion, who has worked at Cell Signaling Technology for almost 10 years. He joined the company as a product development scientist where he oversaw the validation and release of over 100 different antibody products. Dr. Cuvion also led a team responsible for generation of antibodies and kits used for enrichment and analysis of post-translational modifications. Anthony currently works as a special project manager in the marketing group where he is committed to guiding CST's adherence to antibody validation standards and practices. Anthony has been active in attending and presenting at major meetings regarding the topic of antibody reproducibility and works with the subject matter experts, antibody users, and CST scientists to ensure that CST continues to lead the field in antibody quality and consistency. Our second speaker today is Dr. Wetzel, who has been at Cell Signaling Technology for 15 years and is currently leads the antibody testing and validation team, the antibody conjunction team, and an assay development team specializing in ELISA bead assay, and multiplex IHC kits. Randy's areas of expertise include wide field, confocal and spectral fluorescent microscopy, automated high content imaging, flow cytometry, novel dye and conjugation chemistry, and sandwich assay development. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Cuvion and Dr. Wetzel. I will now turn the presentation over to them. Welcome, Anthony and Randy. Thank you, Susie. This is going to be a two-part presentation, beginning with uh, myself, Anthony Cuvion, and the tail end of the seminar will be, or the webinar rather, will be given by Randy Wetzel. I'd like to briefly introduce you to Cell Signaling Technology. As Susie mentioned, we are a private, global company. We were founded by scientists, and we focus our efforts on application antibody-driven development, especially focusing on application-specific validation, quality control, and technical support. Cell signaling technology has developed three generations of in-house rabbit monoclonal technology, and over 95% of our monoclonal antibodies are recombinant. Almost all of the antibody development and manufacturing occurs at our global headquarters in Danver, Danvers, Massachusetts, under ISO 9001 guidelines. And our mission statement is to deliver the world's highest quality research, diagnostic, and therapeutic progress products that accelerate biological understanding and enable personalized medicine. Many of you over the past few years have probably heard or seen papers uh, talk, calling into question antibody quality. And cell signaling technologies, as we've mentioned, has committed itself to trying to provide the highest quality 
reagents available. As a result of that, we have some pointers that we'd like to share with you in terms of finding good antibodies and how to validate an antibody. In other words, how to trust the reagents that you're using in the lab. But first, I want to talk a little bit about the antibody market that we're specifically talking about, which is the research use only antibody market. This market has the most number of vendors and most number of suppliers, but is regulated by the fewest number of um, specifications. In short, there, any company in the research use antibody market can offer any number of antibodies and make any number of claims with very little oversight. Currently, as of yesterday, as a matter of fact, there are almost 4 million antibodies listed in the antibody research market. This is data from CIDAB. Uh, about 2.5 million of those are polyclonal, and just over a million are monoclonal. This is represented by 152 different suppliers. In other words, there's no shortage of research use antibodies, but how many of those are good antibodies? How many of those are reliable in the uh, assays that you're trying to use? In other words, it's important that you're not only using the best antibodies, but that you take steps to make sure that you're validating your antibodies prior to use. When one thinks about using an antibody, it's important to think about all of the different properties that make a good antibody. Now, of course, you can consult the scientific literature, um, but as many of you know, trying to find out which reagents were used by which individual investigators is not always a trivial task. Sometimes investigators don't list the reagents they used, or they would give incomplete materials and methods sections. Producers are guilty as well. They don't often have transparent data. They don't show all the validation data that they do, if they do validation data. And oftentimes, companies will resell the same product from multiple different vendors. And oftentimes, the reselling of antibodies is not clearly documented. There are a number of search engines and aggregators out there that store information about antibodies available, such as BioCompare and others, and, but these also have very little transparency. Which ones are ads? Which ones are real reviews? Um, it's important that you understand what you're looking at when you're reviewing these antibodies. You can also ask your colleagues and your peers, and this is generally a great way of getting uh, information about which products work the best, but oftentimes you're using new reagents that nobody has used before. So a lot of times you have to take your own steps in order to find and select a good antibody. The upshoot is that if you don't use a good reagent, you're going to end up wasting time and money, but most importantly, you're going to suffer a loss of reputation. Nobody wants to retract a manuscript because the antibodies that they use throughout their, their paper turn out to be incorrect. And nobody wants to be known for publishing poor or weak data. And so it's important that you take the, the effort upon yourself to make sure that you're using good reagents every single time you're doing an experiment. And my colleague, Dr. Wetzel, is going to talk in more detail about the exact steps that you need to use in order to do that. In general, I'm going to share with you some things that, that you should do and think about before choosing an antibody. Now, what is being done? There is a number of efforts, there are a number of efforts ongoing currently in order to address the antibody reproducibility problem. Some of you may have noticed that journals such as Cell Press and Nature and Science and Elsevier are actually adopting new guidelines, Cell in particular using the STAR methodology, in which authors need to clearly identify every reagent used in a manuscript, including antibodies, in many cases using the Research Reagent ID, or RRID. Granting agencies and institutions are stepping up training for investigators, postdocs, and graduate students to make sure that these individuals know how to design and interpret an experiment appropriately. The NIH and others, the GBSI, the Global Biological Standards Institute, are also implementing educational programs and increasing the guidelines and standards around antibody use and publication. Vendors are also joining the fight in the sense that we are offering greater transparency, we are doing more testing, more validation than we've ever done before. 
CST in particular has always prided itself on its strong application-driven validation. And we often provide as many, as much supporting information as we can, including reagents and controls and award-winning technical support to be able to help you do a successful experiment. On the other hand, users can always benefit from more education and training, making sure that they're following the guidelines and standards set up not only by the granting agencies, uh, but also following protocols and guidelines given by the vendors. In other words, if you can't repeat the experiment the way the vendor did it, the antibody was probably not valid to start with. In the end, what's most important is for the users to demand more. And what I mean by this is that you shouldn't just buy a reagent and use it, and if it doesn't work, don't say anything. Call the vendor. Ask why, how they got their antibody to work. Ask what conditions they validated under. It may be that it is a very good antibody, it's just not being used in the correct way. In general, the following things can be done. You need to validate your antibody in the model and the application that you plan to use it in. Nothing is more important than that. You should always also conclude, can include a positive and negative model system in addition to any experimental controls. At CST, we use the term binary models. And what this means is models in which you're using a genetic positive negative system, such as a knockout of CRISPR, or you're using an inhibitor or an activator to measure the specificity of the antibody. One thing that we'll reiterate throughout this talk is that using your secondary antibody alone or doing a peptide block alone is not proof of specificity, as Randy will demonstrate. When in doubt, use the protocol described by the vendor. Not all antibodies will work in a general protocol or your favorite protocol that you use every day in your lab. That's not saying that the antibody is a bad antibody. It just means that the antibody or the antigen is functional only under a certain set of conditions. It's important that if you can't get an antibody to work, to use the vendor's protocol. If you still can't get it to work, then the vendor needs to justify why they're selling that antibody. And whenever you get a new lot of antibody, regardless of how it was manufactured, whether it's a recombinant antibody or a polyclonal antibody, you should test each lot to make sure it behaves exactly as you expect based on the previous lot prior to using it. And again, demand more information from the vendors. Demand to know how they validated the antibody, what the supporting data is, what applications it was approved of, and, and, and how it was tested. Again, I've already reiterated many of these things, but I want to make sure that we're super clear on the idea that, and that CST adheres to, is that we validate in every application independently. The idea being that validation in one application in one particular protocol does not guarantee the performance in any other application or protocol. And there are exceptions to this rule, but in general, the performance of an antibody by IHC can give you some degree of idea of how specific the antibody is, but it doesn't tell you whether or not the antibody will work for IHC, for example. Antibodies must always be validated in the desired model system and application using a defined protocol by both the vendor and the end user. In short, the end user should be able to replicate whatever it is that the vendor has done. Much like a scientific paper, the first step that you would do is try to replicate what the other lab has done the same should be true for antibody vendors. All claims should be supported by data. I cannot reiterate this enough, is that vendors should show all the data that they have supporting the validations for their products. And again, everything needs to be validated between lots regardless of how it's produced. And lastly, even the best antibody, can, when it's used incorrectly, can use incorrect non-reproducible results. So what are the things that you look for when you're choosing a new antibody? Is it the number and quality of citations? Is it user reviews online? Is it recommendations from a colleague? Is it the data that you see on the vendor website or the reputation of the vendor? Is it previous experience? If you've had a bad experience with one company, do you go back to them again? Or is it something else? My recommendations from having developed hundreds of antibodies in my career is that what most people are doing these days is using Google or some version of Google to first look for antibodies. 
the hard thing about this is that you can often not tell what is being top ranked based on data or what's being top ranked based on advertising or keyword stuffing. Literature is a great place to find good antibodies, again, with the shortcoming of the fact that not all materials and methods are described well. I find CIDAB and BenchSci, including LabOM, which is now known as the Validated Antibody Database, to be great sources of literature-based antibody information. There's also a number of user review sites, such as PadMabs, Antibody, and even BioCompare, which have information from users, but they don't always capture how the antibody was used or the, all the protocol information that one would need to decide to whether that's a good antibody or not. You can also go to the vendor sites and see what data they have. Last of all, you need to ask. Core labs use lots of antibodies, and many of the core lab directors that I've spoken with keep detailed records about the functionality of their antibodies, the antibodies they use. Collaborators and colleagues are a great source of information, and as always, tech support. Ask about supporting validation, alternative methods that were used, et cetera. For more specific examples, I'm actually going to turn the talk over now to Dr. Randy Wetzel, who is the Director of Cytometry here at CST. Randy? Thanks, Anthony. That was a, a great uh, introduction to the problem here. Um, what, what I'm going to talk about is how we validate antibodies here at Cell Signaling, and hopefully uh, you uh, can use this information to guide your own antibody validation. So starting with this first slide, which is uh, uh, my depiction of the five pillars of antibody va validation that was discussed by uh, Ulan et al., uh, it really talks about validating antibodies using a, a number of different methods at the same time. And that's the strategy that, that we use at Cell Signaling. So we have a number of tests that we do, uh, and I'm going to roll through and show you some examples of each of these. So the first is staining positive or negative cells or tissue. This is really one of the easiest and, and goes into what Anthony described as a binary model. So in the top, you're looking at flow cytometry data, and you see box P3 expression in the, the Tregs. Uh, co-localized with CD25 to confirm that. In the bottom, we're looking at uh, uh, EPCAM expression in positive and negative cell lines. So this is a great binary model. We can also look at subcellular localization. So um, often that can tell you if a target is specific or not. If you know it should be localized, say, to the plasma membrane and you see stain in, inside the cell or in the nucleus, then you know there's a problem there. Uh, we also look at uh, Tissue-specific expression, so working in, in uh, frozen or paraffin tissues, looking at where, where the signal is in that tissue. Is it, is it in the Purkinje cells or is it in, in the, uh, the meiotic cells in, in the testes? So often this can, can help us determine if an antibody has non-specificity. For signaling antibodies specifically, we look at different inhibitors and ligands, ways to, to stimulate the pathways. So in the two pictures on the left, this is an EGFR antibody, a total antibody, and you can see where EGFR is in the top left picture in untreated cells, and when we treat the cells with EGF, now you see that receptor has been internalized. Looking at the two pictures on the right, this is now a phospho antibody, so you see there's no green stain in the top, and when we treat with EGF, we see phospho-EGF turned on. Uh, note that these weren't the same time. The, uh, the one on the right is, is a shorter time period. Um, we can also look at translocation. So here is YAP, and you see in low confluency, YAP is restricted to the nucleus, and as the cells become more confluent, you see cyto and nuke. And uh, you might think that's kind of messy stain. I don't know if that's real, but you can see on the bottom there's a, na a YAP negative cell line, and there's no stain in, in there. Um, we also concurrently test in multiple applications. So at cell signaling, that includes things like Western blots, IHC on paraffin, uh, IHC in frozen sections, ICC, um, flow cytometry, so a lot of different apps. And the reason for that is often one application will tell you something that another one didn't. For example, if I'm doing flow cytometry and uh, I'm looking at blood, there's no um, blood vessels, there's no muscle, there's no other cells. The same with ICC. So often one application will find a problem uh, that the others uh, can't see. And so having 
all these data together helps us out quite a bit. Um, this, this is one example where uh, the Western blots actually looked very clean. These are real data. These are four different clones that we were testing here with Western shown from four different cell lines. Uh, sorry, five, four, yeah, four different cell lines. And uh, they all look pretty specific, but when you look at the localization down below, you can see they're all very different. Some are restricted to the nucleus. Some are, look, appear to be mitochondrial and, and different mixes. So this is a great example where the combination of multiple applications can really tell you a lot more about an antibody. Uh, knockout cells or tissues is another great method. So shown here is an IHC stain where on the top is wild type tissue and uh, you see the RBPFUH in those bronchial epithelial cells. And in the bottom picture, we have a conditional knockout of, of RBPFUH, and you see there is no stain there. Sorry, only in the bronchial epithelial cells. Um, peptide arrays are another good way to look. So um, the, the, the example that I have for this is one of the best ones, I think, is how do you validate an epigenetic antibody that is, for example, H3K27 trimethyl? So there, are, you can look at it with um, immunocytochemistry or, or uh, imaging and see that it's restricted to the nucleus. You can look on a Western blot and see that it's the correct molecular weight for histone. But how do you really know it's trimethyl and not monomethyl or dimethyl? And so we use peptide arrays for this, where we array out peptides with all the different modifications. And it's a great way to quickly look and see which antibodies are specific and which uh, have, have some preference for other epitopes or, or even you know, or cross-reactive with other sites. Um, you can also compare stain to other antibodies or to uh, RNA detection. So this, the example I'm showing you is one where we're looking at uh, three different antibodies, and you can see that the localization is the same in all three, with all three antibodies. This, this kind of lends, lends weight that your antibody is correct. Um, the, there's an example now showing uh, MET. So in this case, uh, we were using formalin-fixed paraffin-embedded cell pellets that either express MET, like the two on the top, or do not express MET, like the three on the bottom. As you can see, the CST antibody on the left is only staining the positive cells and is not staining the negative cells. However, the other antibody on the right is uh, light in one of the positives and actually positive in some of the negative cells. When this is then taken to tissue, you can see, again, nice clean membrane stain like you would expect from MET, whereas with the other antibody, kind of mushy stain that's, that's all over and, and the localization does not match what would be expected from MET. Uh, another method is immunoprecipitation. So in this case, uh, looking at the TOR complex. So if we IP with uh, G beta L, we can then probe for and detect mTOR. Or if we uh, IP with mTOR, we can probe and detect Raptor. So it's another way to show that there's specificity based on your knowledge of the protein interactions as they, as they are in the uh, endogenous systems. Uh, two examples that are commonly used that I think I would caution you to at least understand the caveats. One is phosphatase treatment. So um, you can treat fixed cells, fixed slides, um, fresh, anything it, with a phosphatase. And what this does is it completely eliminates all phosphorylation. And so that, if you had a phosphoantibody and you take your tissue and treat with phosphatase, there should be no stain there. And if you do see, see stain, then that means your antibody is not totally phospho-specific. But the thing to remember is phosphatase is not telling you that the antibody is target specific, only that it's phosphorylation. It's phospho X, but you don't know what that X is. The other one is uh, that I would caution you about is staining transfected cells. The example shown here is EML4. So um, I would direct you toward the middle image where you see dim but, but definitely positive basal EML4 expression in, the, in these HeLa cells. You can knock that down on the left with siRNA. But note what happens on the right if we transfect in EML4. Now only the transfected cells look positive and you don't see the dim stain. So if, if this were truly nonspecific stain, but you simply express the protein in cells, you would, you would really see the transfected protein because it's often at a high expression, and you would miss the nonspecific stain that's there in the background. As a rule, we try not to use uh, transfected cell models for antibody validation. 
The last two, I think, are not examples of specificity. Um, blocking with the immunizing peptide, uh, as, as you should hopefully know, any antibody will be blocked by the immunizing peptide. So whether it's specific or nonspecific, this is not a good control. And also omission of the primary, as Anthony mentioned, it's a great way to look at the, the, the tissue, the secondary reagents, how much staining are they having in the tissue, but this doesn't tell you anything about the specificity of the antibody. So I'd like to go into some myths. And yeah, I created the image of the unicorn with the uh, antibody antler. I love that thing. Um, so I'm gonna go through a few common myths that we hear in technical support. First one, if I buy an antibody from a known vendor, I don't need to worry about specificity. This is not true. So uh, here's an example where you're looking at some phospho ERK antibodies. Uh, and there were uh, a CST, in the Western bot on the left, you can see the CST antibody, and then two competitor antibodies. Note the, the, all the nonspecific bands. Uh, when we look at the IF images on the right, uh, competitor number two in this case was not validated for IF, so we didn't feel it was fair to, to test that. But competitor one was validated for, for IF, so we tested that. And you can clearly see with the CST antibody the on and off in, in treated or inhibited. And in the competitor antibody, it's just dim stain in both conditions. Another example here is uh, it started in our flow cytometry lab where we were looking at uh, two different antibodies for phosphostat 5, and we saw a, a much greater signal with, with a competitor antibody. And so we started to look into that and, and ran some Western blots, as you see on the right, and note that very large high molecular weight band. Uh, this is typically seen where we see receptor tyrosine kinases. And so then we took cells and treated them with uh, EGF. And so um, what you see here in the, on the left is nice nuclear stain, like you would expect for phosphostat 5. But on the right, that's clearly indicative of, of a membrane protein, most likely uh, EGFR in this case. So this, this antibody appears to be cross-reacting. This antibody is sold primarily for flow cytometry. So someone doing an experiment with this might not know that this, this antibody is not specific. Uh, the next myth, a good antibody will work in any protocol. Hopefully Anthony pounded this message home protocol and, and sample type are really critical. So there are a number of different protocols out there. This is a, a, a summary of a lot of them that are used in imaging. So there's different methods of fixation, permeabilization, diluents, antigen retrieval. All of these things can affect antibody performance. So I'm gonna show you an example. This is maybe a bit of an overkill. We were looking to optimize the staining protocol for an LC3B antibody. This antibody should stain autophagosomes. And so we set up a 96-well plate where every well was a slightly different protocol. So the only thing they have in common is they all have the same cells and the same antibody, but we vary the protocol. So on the left, it's one fixation method. On the right, it's a different one. And then each row down is a different method of permeabilization in different concentrations. So as I switch to the image from our high-content imagers, you should see right away already a difference in signal from the left to the right. Um, but maybe that's non-specific stain. So we, we dig in and look at all the images, and in the end chose one that really improved the signal to noise. So um, our standard protocol is on the left, 4% formaldehyde with 0.25% with triton, and on the right is the optimized protocol. And you can see the dramatic increase in signal. Uh, here's the actual IF image. So you, you can't even see the autophagosomes on, with the protocol on the left, but they're clearly visible on the right. And now this could be used in a, in a much more involved study. So here you see a few autophagosomes in untreated cells. Nicardipine, you see an increased number. Loperamide, even more. And as you would expect, chloroquine has the most. So tweaking the protocol really made this antibody work well. Uh, this is another example with some stem cell antibodies. So uh, the, the antibodies on the left, middle, and right columns are all different pairs. So in red on the left is NANOG, and on the bottom, uh, on the green is TRA-181. So there are a couple different protocols here, DOTMAC perm on the top and Triton perm on the bottom. And you can see in those left two images, the TRA-181 is all bunched up on the membrane, if you, would, if you saw this, hopefully you would call cell signaling and say, hey, it's not working. 
and we would say, we know, let's, let's try a different protocol, try the dot MAC. And you can see for all of these pairs, the OX4 TRA 181 in the middle and the SOX2 SSEA4 on the right, the, the preferred protocol gives the correct localization. This is another example of fixation. So you, uh, cross-linking fixatives like formaldehyde and glutaraldehyde are very good for most antibodies, but some, notably the keratin antibodies, do not work well. They actually do better in a precipitating fix like methanol, shown here. So you can see the stain is still absolutely correct and, and looks good in the methanol. This last slide on protocol uh, looks at a bunch of different tweaks. So whether you're going to methanol fix or methanol perm, on the upper right, decreasing the formaldehyde concentration, or even changing the blocking solution. All of these can have a dramatic impact on the antibody performance. So as Anthony mentioned, it's always best to go with the vendor supplied protocol first and make sure everything's working, and then you can do your tweaks after. Uh, often people want to combine antibodies in multiplex experiments, and sometimes the protocols are not the same. Um, if, if you're unable to get it work, I would recommend give us a call. Uh, we have a lot of experience with this, and we can probably help you choose a protocol that will work with the antibodies that you'd like to use. The next myth is a common one. Uh, an antibody that's validated in one application will work in another. In this case, ICC or frozen sections will work in FFPE. Often you say, you hear, oh, if it's got a good Western, then it'll work in, in IHC. That's not true. So um, this is a, a, a wonderful antibody, a P10 antibody, shown in the upper left staining uh, human colon. And we also did uh, formalin-fixed paraffin-embedded cell pellets. And you can see in the P10 positive cells on the, on the top, it's nice, nice correct stain. And on the P10 negative cells, they're negative. However, when we did immunocytochemistry with these same cell lines, you can see that the P10 negative cells also have stain. So in this case, uh, how the sample is prepared makes a big difference in, in how the antibody will perform. Uh, the next myth is, I treated my cells with a ligand, and I should see an increase in phosphorylation, but it, I don't see it. The antibody must not be working. Uh, often when we hear this, it, it, it's more a question of where, this, where the level of signaling is at a basal level. So you can see here in these C2C12 cells, if we serum starve them, as on the bottom, uh, you see very little stain, and when we treat with insulin, you see lots of stain. And so um, in this case, we've gone from an almost off to an almost all on condition. And you can use, as, as I've shown here, next to off, you can serum starve, use inhibitors, you can treat with phosphatase, and on the on side, you can use ligands. And so this will give you an idea of where your particular cells or sample is in terms of off or on. Uh, if it happens to be, say, low here, you might see a, a good shift when you add a ligand. However, if it happens to be already on, then adding a ligand is not going to change it. And this is a great example shown on the right now. This is a P10 null LN cap cell line that uh, without the inhibition from P10 on the AKT pathway, you see it's just signaling like crazy. So um, if, if you were to take these cells and treat with a ligand, you would not expect to see a change uh, in signaling. Also, if you were to take away a growth factor, since this is, is constitutively active, you would also not see a decrease in stain. So I think it's important to understand what, what the level of signaling is. Similarly, if you're using antibodies that detect total protein, understanding what the level of expression is in your cells. Uh, another common issue we have is um, customers will call and say, you know, I can't, I can't see any signal with this antibody in my cells, and we look and it's a cell line that doesn't happen to express that protein or it's very low. We use the, the um, cell, cell line encyclopedia at the Broad, the CCLE. Uh, this is a great database. The, the, the um, web address is there on the bottom. So from this, you can see things like uh, RNA-seq data, DNA copy number, even protein level for, by mass spec. So in this case, we use the CCLE database to find a strong positive and a, a good dead negative, and then we had another, oops, sorry, uh, U2OS cells in the middle that, that had uh, moderate expression. Uh, the last myth I'm going to talk about is, is uh, you can make weak signal brighter by adding more antibody. Uh, this is a, a big no-no. So um, antibody dilution is determined by titration, 
and the optimal concentration of an antibody is where all of the target is occupied by antibody. So if you're below that, your signal might be dim, but if you go above that, since there's no more target to, to be bound by the antibody, you're only increasing nonspecific signal. So in the graph shown here, the blue is the signal in positive cells, and the red is the signal in negative cells. These were, these were done on a high-content imager. And if you look at the optimal concentration, you see nice, clean, positive stain in, in the positive cells and very little signal in the untreated ne or negative cells. If you were to go to a higher antibody concentration or a lower dilution, you would actually see a lot of nonspecific stain. So it's very important to work in the optimal concentration of the antibody. And we provide all this on the data sheet. Um, as, as a, a quick tip, if, if you do want to make an antibody brighter, maybe consider using something like tyramide or, or another method of amplification. So on the left, you see conventional immunofluorescence with a, a conjugated secondary used to detect that primary. On the right, we're using an HRP conjugated secondary. And tyramide, in the presence of HRP and, and uh, peroxide, will bind to the protein in that area. In this case, tyramide has been conjugated to a green dye, and so you're seeing an accumulation of dye on the target protein. This can amplify your signal 10 to uh, a thousand fold, depending on how long you let it run. So on the left, you can see fossil work. This normally would look great. We've just turned the gains down for, for, to show the difference between the two. But you see the difference between treated on the top and untreated on the bottom. Note how it's much brighter on the right with the ampl uh, tyramide amplification. Another way to improve your signal without changing the antibody concentration is to vary the protocol, maybe add in some antigen retrieval. This is very common in FFPE sections, but uh, less often used in, in frozen sections, but works like a charm. So in this case, it's a, it's a, a hot boiling citric acid antigen retrieval step really brings out these Shank 3 epitopes in, in these brain tissues. So in conclusion, I would say proper antibody validation is critical. So whether it's uh, us as a vendor or you as a user doing this, um, you know, understand what, what validation means. If someone tells you their antibody is validated, understand what the protocol is, what the sample is, what tests were done, was it a binary model, do they, did they really cover all their bases? If you don't see the data, as Anthony said, definitely call and ask. So if you call cell signaling and you have a question about an antibody, uh, a scientist will help answer that question. If, if it's in a particular application, like, say, flow cytometry, you can call and ask to speak to someone in the flow cytometry group, and they'll talk you through what was done in the validation. Uh, CFT provides optimized protocols and validation data for all of ours, so we don't give you a a dilution range. We tell you what the dilution is based on a titration, and we have all the data to back that up. Unfortunately, we're not able to show everything we have on a data sheet, but definitely give us a call and we can share all of that data with you. And uh, our scientists, as I said, are here to provide application-specific technical support, so if you need help multiplexing, if you need help working an antibody into your experiment, you're not sure quite how to do it, please give us a call and we'd be happy to talk you through the protocols. So uh, with that, I'm going to stop and uh, turn it back over to you, Susie. Thank you. Thank you, Anthony, and thank you, An Randy, for your informative presentation. We will now start that live Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have any questions, audience members, that you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on that green Q&A button at the lower left of your presentation window, type your questions into the box that appear on the screen, and click the Send button. So let's take a look at our audience questions coming in. <clears throat> First question, why a peptide block is not proof of specificity? That's a great question. Thanks, uh, Rebecca. Uh, I would say um, so. A, a, an antibody that's raised against a peptide uh, will bind to that peptide. But let's say the antibody cross-reacts and also binds, say, 12 other proteins. If you add the peptide to the antibody, the antibody will bind to it and will be effectively blocked. And now when you put it on tissue, it won't be able to stain that protein, but also you won't see any stain for the other 12 that it was cross-reacting with. So um, it's, it's a good way maybe if you want to use your primary as 
like an isotype control on tissue because you, you essentially take it out of commission so it can't bind. But um, even a nonspecific antibody will be blocked by the immunizing peptide. And as a follow-up to, to that question, really, the, the uh, peptides can actually be used, as Randy described, for determining the specificity in a competitive assay. So if you want to know if your, if your antibody is phosphospecific, outside of a phosphatase, you could actually do a treatment where you use a modified peptide versus the unmodified peptide. Um, but only in the context of that kind of assay is, is peptide validation really uh, useful for determining the specificity. Thank you. And gentlemen, if an antibody does not list a method of um, authenticated use, how can I determine whether this was tested and failed by the vendor or whether it has not been tested? That's a, another great question. Um, so uh, often you'll see when an antibody is validated for an application, but I think what this person is asking is, what if you don't see it? How do I know if it's been tested? That um, it, we're trying to uh, put that data out as much as we can, but in the short term, definitely you can call us. Um, most of our antibodies have been tested on a number of applications, uh, certainly all of our um, monoclonals. So we have data to support that, and, and um, if, if you want to call us, we can tell you what test was done. We can share with you the data. Sometimes, you know, it, it may be if we tested it in in 10 different tissue models or cell models, we saw a problem in one, and we'd be happy to share that data with you and show you what we have. But uh, um, right now, we only are able to show you the applications that it, it, it does work in. Yeah, and as a, a, another follow-up to that, a, a new tool that has been made available to scientists that I think is, is really good at, at determining in ways in which an antibody has been used. Uh, I mentioned in one of my earlier slides a site called BenchSci. Um, they actually pull literature-based use cases of, of antibodies. So if you find an antibody from a vendor that you're interested in or you're looking for an antibody against a specific target, uh, BenchSci and, and to a similar degree, Cytab do a great job of telling you, allowing you to filter on the applications in which the antibody was used uh, and from there, you can determine the methods uh, in the paper. It's so long as they're listed, obviously, uh, you can determine the methods that the antibody was used in and may be able to use one of those methods um, with the correct controls uh, to use that antibody in your experiment. Thank you. And I also want to remind audience members, thank you for your participation and your questions coming in. Our next question. What recommendations for validation series with a novel antibody in a new organism? Uh, another great question. Um, something that plagues us often is, is I'll add to that uh, a, a novel protein where the localization may not be known. Uh, so the first thing I would do working in different organisms is maybe do a blast search if you, if you know the uh, epitope of the antibody and see uh, how conserved that, that epitope is in the species in which you're working. Um, a, probably a Western blot is also a very good quick, you know, do I see anything? Is it the correct molecular weight? Are there other bands in there? Um, after that, I think if you know the expected localization and you're pretty confident about that, then go ahead and try staining that sample and see if the expected localization is correct. Um, and if, certainly, if, if knockouts are available, that's, that's also a great way to, to show that the antibody is specific. Great. Thank you. Our next question, I've noticed that some of CST's products don't appear to adhere to the validation guidelines you discussed. Can you comment on why this is the case? Yes, so this is an issue that we are attempting to fix. What I can say with a great degree of confidence is that almost 70% of our monoclonal products have been validated using some sort of binary model. Um, that includes knockout validation, that includes uh, plus and minus uh, treatment or inhibition. Um, part of our limitation is our ability to display all of the data that we generate on our website. Um, in the in the development of a product sometimes can take upwards of two years, we generate a huge amount of information. Um, and until recently, we have done a 
relatively poor job of collecting that information in one place in a way that we can display it to the user in, a, in an organized fashion. But we're actually working on fixing that. And certainly our scientists and our production teams are more than happy to share any information that we don't display on our website with you if you call. I know that that's not an ideal answer, uh, but sometimes uh, that's the best way to get insight as to how an antibody was validated uh, and how it was tested, uh, the protocols used, the, the materials used, et cetera. Wonderful, thank you. We have time for a couple more questions from our audience. The next one, I wanted to use one of your products for IHC, but it was not listed among the approved applications. I did find a couple of papers where the antibody was used for IHC. Why don't you add this to your approved applications list? Uh, yeah, and also a common question. People will say, oh, you know, uh, you don't validate this antibody, but I used it and it stained my sample, or I see a, a publication. Um, th there's a, a chance that whoever used it in, in that experiment did everything correctly, and, and it is right, but um, there's also a chance that the antibody has an issue that, that maybe the researcher didn't realize. Um, perhaps they themselves didn't use a, a negative cell or tissue to validate or a knockout. They, they put it on tissue and it kind of looked like they expected and went forward. Um, I think the, uh, the, the BenchSci um, website that Anthony mentioned is a good way to look at where an antibody is in, in other papers, but I would always be a, a little skeptical. Look, read their methods and try to understand what they did and, and how it's working, and then uh, definitely contact us and, and ask us why it's not validated. So, you know, perhaps we saw something in, in a cell line that's not in your experiment or in a tissue that's not in your experiment, or maybe uh, we saw a stain that, um, as I mentioned before, if it's a novel protein and you don't know where it should be, if you expect cytoplasmic stain but you see something in the mitochondria, and we can't find a, a paper or anyone to show that that is actually correct, we would err on the side of caution and not validate it for that application. Yeah, and to follow up on what Randy's saying is that, that we have kind of three levels of recommendation, right? If we put the application up with our product, that means that we validate it and we stand behind it. There are other, two other possibilities. One, that we didn't test it because at the time we didn't think uh, that that application was important for that particular target or we lacked the model system to do it or we tested it and got some sort of negative or inconclusive results. And so we have a large number of products that, you know, looked great up front, but maybe there's some aberrant staining that Randy was talking about that um, we don't fully feel comfortable releasing that product. Um, and so again, calling in can help answer that question because the teams can tell you, this is how we tested it, these are the results that we got, this is why we don't recommend it. Um, and there are cases in which people will publish with our antibodies, um, and we do, in an application that we don't approve, we actually do collect that information, but because we don't support that particular application, we don't then show it on our website. However, that does drive us to then review. So if a number of publications coming out saying antibody A was used in IHC, that stimulates us to go back and test it to see if we should be supporting it in that particular method. So customers are our best friends when it comes to crowdsourcing validation information that we may not be aware of. Thank you, gentlemen. And do you test an antibody in tissues or cells where the target is known to, to have very uh, level of expression? Yeah, that's exactly what we do. So um, we wouldn't want to test an antibody that has very high expression of, a, of the target protein. Uh, because, uh, you know, if we then stamp our, our validation seal on that, what you're using in a cell or tissue that has more moderate level of expression, you, it may not work in your hands. So we want to look at, ideally, uh, something that's negative or very low and something with, you know, a sort of moderate or endogenous levels of expression. Um, we would avoid things that are, are just very, very high levels of expression, like the transfected models. But um, in generally, we want to look at normal levels of expression. So uh, to answer the question, yes, definitely we want to look in cells that have varying levels of, of protein expression. 
Thank you. And gentlemen, do you sell control lysates or slides that someone can use to validate their antibodies in their lab? Absolutely, yeah. So we sell for, for a number of our, our um, better selling antibodies, we actually sell extracts um, that we validate ourselves. They're used to do internally validate, so those are, again, sell lysates. We also sell um, IHC control slides that can be used not only to test your protocol, but also to test the antibody uh, to make sure that it's that they're working uh, um, to your as as advertised. Um, with this is an area that we'd like to expand because it's important to us that researchers can have a successful uh, experiment with our reagents, and so providing you the controls and the other materials that you need to generate that is one of our um, our top missions. Thank you, Randy and Anthony. This has been a great Q&A. Do you have any closing remarks you'd like to provide for our audience before we end today? Yeah, the, the one thing I will say, and, and I'll speak before Randy in this case, but um, I would say that, that customers, antibody users, are going to hear a lot of noise um, about antibody validation and what antibody validation means. Uh, from vendors, from organizations, uh, from their own institutes. And the bottom line is that it is really important um, that you validate the reagents that you're using in your experiments. I spent uh, some extra time in graduate school using an antibody that ended up not being, uh, not being specific for the target of interest. And uh, there's nothing more demoralizing than the feeling that you've been you know, wasting time in graduate school um, on something that doesn't work. So I think it's important that people uh, from, a, from a, a, you know, time and resource perspective make sure that you're using the right stuff and make sure that what you're listening to and what you're hearing, it makes sense um, with practices of being, um, you know, using a binary model, testing lot to lot, and making sure the antibody works in the application and the protocol in which you're using. And, uh, Anthony, I would, oh, go ahead. Go yeah, ahead. sorry. Yeah, I would also say the same. Be, be skeptical. You know, look carefully at those publications. Don't don't just trust that that the validation was done. You know, really dig into the protocol. And if you don't see something convincing, reach out to the person. Reach out to the vendor. Uh, you know, I know we would be happy to talk to people and and tell you exactly what we did, and also help help if there's a, a problem with one of our uh, antibodies. Thank you again, Dr. Kubion, Dr. Wetzel, for your presentation. I'd also like to thank LabRoots and Cell Signaling Technology for making today's educational webcast possible. Before we go, I want to remind audience members that today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through June of 2018. You'll receive an email from LabRoots letting you know when this webcast will be available for replay. Please share that announcement with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. That's all for now, and thank you so much for joining us. We hope to see you again soon. Goodbye.